Now, this case, maxilla and mandible, has been treated at the same day. I play six and six implants. And you see here, we have excellent here distribution of the loading forces. The patient was a heavy smoker. And after seven months, we have this beautiful result aesthetically. We can restore also maxilla and mandible in the same day if we know what we do using the correct implant design. And this is the soft tissue after seven months. After removal of the prosthesis, which was cement retained restoration, and trust me, I like cement retained restorations, and I don't have problems with the cementation that I lose, I have some failure or too much material in the sur uh, surrounding tissues because I don't use too much tembond. And I don't use any cotton pellets to close these areas of the implants, but these areas of the abutments, I, they are already here filled with tembond. And then I have some access hole for the superficial, uh, so if you, I use too much uh, cementation material. And now we go ahead to the single tooth restoration. This has been done with one of my residents when I was at the NYU. Dr. Basar is, is his name, and he is now a resident at the University of Rochester. He moved with me four years ago. Here we decided to make a <clears throat> full thickness flap, and we have a vertical defect and also a horizontal defect. We decided to take uh, some autogenous bone from the posterior maxilla, from the tuberosity, and we mixed here with bios cancellus. And on the top, we use the Baumet extent and also ACE here tax in order to stabilize the membrane in place. And you see, after that, we were able to advance the flap. Classical case with, autogen with augmentation. And after the augmentation, after one month, we don't discuss about the papilla height because after a couple of weeks or months, you see the soft tissue looks great. And we go now almost flapless because we have bone. And we make an H type of incision. And we place an implant with a progressive thread design. And we place here the abutment. And we are able to measure, to evaluate the stability of this implant using period test device or the Ostel device. And we do at the same day a provisionalization out of occlusion. That's why I don't talk about immediate loading. I'm talking about immediate provisionalization. And you see preoperatively how was the defect after the augmentation and after the implant placement looks like that. The patient had moved from New York State to California, and unfortunately I couldn't evaluate the final result, but we know that he's very happy with his uh, final restoration. In that particular case, we talk about the aesthetic zone in a compromised bone conditions. We have insufficient width and height in this maxilla or premaxilla. And you see in the CT scan the situation. And we decided to do the surgery here in the residency program together with one of my residents, Dr. Chorney. Today she is faculty in the period department. I did the augmentation with autogenous bone, posterior man mandible, cortico cancellus block, which has been particulated. I'm positive that Mike, Michael showed yesterday to you very nice results and work, what he does much better than I do, actually, with autogenous bone. And I use the bone mill to particulate this bone. And because I need a lot of volume for the left and the right side, in this particular case, we mix with uh, uh, Puros allograft <coughs> from Zimmer. And on the top, Biomat extent in the one side and flap closure. And then we go to the left side, where my resident does the left side. And I assist her in the same way. And you see now, excuse me, the flap closure by, uh, for both sides, and this is radiographically the situation after the surgery and after two weeks, <coughs> the soft tissue. And if you look now, how was the CT scan preoperatively? We did also at the left side also here, I'm sorry, I don't see very well here, a uh, sinus lift procedure in addition to the augmentation. And you see how it was before and after six months, how much bone we could gain because we have used also autogenous bone. And this is important. At the left side, we had worse condition. Very thin bone and became so thick, so white. And now the question is, folks, for how long would you like to wait to load this bone? Do you place the implants after the six months of healing? 
And then you wait. What happens? You just wait. And you will see later on what happens if you just wait. The bone disappears. So we decide in this particular case to place here the <clears throat> a small um, first abutment for this particular system. And on the top, uh, we screwed the restoration with temporary cylinders, which has been done in the prosthodontic department with Dr. Bake. And you see the bone levels after six months. In, the, in another case, we go a little bit more advanced. I would like to present you and to show you, and in later case we'll show you that much more, that you can augment the sinus and in the same time to place the implants if your implants have primary stability, if you have some remaining bone. So you see here in this particular case, we do the sinus lifts. I place four implants, which are primary stable. On the top, the mini abutments, and then we have the temporary cylinders. And then we measure the stability with the Ostel device. In the most cases, it's more important for st um, uh, the evaluation to make for documentation and scientific purposes, and also for the clinician without a lot of experience to be in a good, to have a good feeling when to, to, to load or not to load the implants. At the left side, we did a sinus lift and we placed the implants simultaneously. And you see the implants are placed not parallel. You see that parallel in the panorex. In the reality, always I place my implants in the area where the bone used to be. Because implants for me are replacement of roots and not of teeth. That's why I replace a root which is missing of a tooth exactly in the same way with an implant, in the same angulation, the maxilla, like the conventional roots of the teeth used to be. And never going to the cingulum for years. And I was surprised today that we discussed this some, uh, like something new. However, you see here the provisionalization, and the patient is very happy, but I am not happy for another issue. This beautiful provisional has been done at the prosthodontic department. And I have realized any time we do extremely good provisionalizations, the patients do not come back. And I have in my new book, Intentions, with the topic advanced immediate loading, that in a very clear label. The provisionalization has to be not extremely aesthetic. It has to be hygienic, it has to be polished, no rough, in order to avoid to have contamination and plaque accumulation. This patient suddenly, after two years, because she's so happy, she doesn't have money for the final restoration. And maybe we have these patients without dollars or euro or yen or, or, or. So what do we do then if we don't have sufficient height, sufficient bone, if the patients don't want to have any kind of augmentations, if we cannot do vertical augmentations with long-term uh, success? Malament, as a prosthodontist, showed the concepts of prosthetics uh, in rich deficiencies. And he shows very nicely that the gingiva colored ceramics can be mimic, which means the normal alveolar height and architecture can be <coughs> reproduced with uh, re pink resin or pink porcelain, and we can have creation of lost or compromised gingiva papilla. Look this case. This is case of mine years ago. The patient is very happy, has relatively low smile line. We don't need to do very high advanced surgical procedures. Look, now this case, this patient, she has high smile line. She used to use a gingiva mask, what she removes. That means she has for years the mentality to remove something and to bring back. She cleans all of the teeth Plaque accumulation, almost plaque index zero, but the teeth have mobility. So we decide to extract the teeth. We don't need to open a huge flap. The bone looks very nice, and then we place implants. And I did this case nine years ago. I don't need to go in these gaps to put any grafting material. Why? Because the bone has very nice here blood supply. Do you see that? The patient doesn't use any blood thinners, or aspirin, nothing else. And here you have very nice blood clot, coagulation and stabilization of the blood clot. That's why I don't need any grafting. And then we load the implants immediately. And this is the provisionalization. 
and the result here after three years with an arch-shaped restoration, removable restoration, implant support restoration. And this is the implants radiographically after eight years. No bone loss. In a removable way, when the implants immediately after surgery have been, of course, uh, connected together with a fixed restoration. Now, look, another case. This patient is very, very rich, I would say. So, belongs to a royal family in Europe. Many years ago, I have done this treatment, and I could keep this teeth for 11 years until I had to come to U.S. permanently, and she asked me, what happens, Professor Romanos, if I lost my teeth, I lose my teeth? She suggested me to do the implant-supported restorations. So it is a very aggressive protocol. I would like to have your attention because I showed you this case first time in my life in a big podium. So we removed here the chin of the patient. We did, after the extraction of this teeth, immediate implants. You see my flap? I didn't remove I didn't uh, open the flap a lot because this bone was very thin and I wouldn't be able to place implants. Sinus lift procedure at the right and at the left side with autogenous bone from the chin. Implant placement as immediate implants. Provisionization in place at the same hour or definitely the same morning. And this is the final result after here 16 months with a very aesthetic result with a removal restoration has a hybrid type removable restoration, and this is after five years the final result. And look at this, this bone stays there because these implants are loaded implants and this bone will be loaded and they stabilize the bone. And this is autogenous bone. I say again, no bios, no pyros, no other grafting materials. It is autogenous bone. If you do the same thing without to place implants and to load this bone, the bone will collapse, and you know that. So, now, another case, very interesting. The patient has a relatively moderate, high, uh, moderate smile line. All of the teeth have mobility. All of the teeth have to be extracted. And here, in this particular case, very old case, we decide to place immediate implants, augmentations in every area with autogenous bone from the residual ridges. And I'd like to show you, after two years, how it looks like the profile of this, the papilla and the, the, the restoration. The patient is very happy, and I am also very happy. But today is not the two-year follow-up. And that's why I'm here today to discuss this was actually the goal, the objective of my lecture for the next eight minutes here, the aesthetics and what we learn from the implant designs and from the immediate versus delayed loading concepts. After two years, we don't have any bone loss. You see that very well? Maybe you can say, great job. I have published this case in a European journal. After now five years, this is, after, I'm sorry, I'll come back. Oh, can you help me, please? <clears throat> Thank you. So after two years, looks like that. You don't know how is the bone bacally and lingually. You know the bone mesially and distally from the panoramic radiography. After eight years, you see in the corners of the mouth, in the canine area, where we have very thin bacal plates because they, the canines are always outside, in most cases, from the arch, the bone collapses faster. Here I have done also a soft tissue graft to stabilize this recession, and the patient is still very happy and I am very happy with the radiography, but from the periodontal standpoint, I have to make a new strategic plan. And now you see two years follow up, five years follow up, eight years follow up. So when I give you this statement today from this case, and this is not the only one case, trust me, I tell you that the soft tissue and the hard tissue changes because of this kind of remodeling in the first five years, folks. Do you know what does mean that? If somebody comes in this room with high smile line and asks you, doctor, doctors, all of us, can you extract my teeth, place the implants and load immediately? This has nothing to do with the immediate loading. It has to do with the immediate implant placement. I give the guarantee for the result after the first five years. Within the first five years, the remodeling is active. So that means you don't know anything and we don't know so many things today. And we look in the literature, 
And Danny Starno and Paula Small, they did a, a different studies in the past in the posterior maxilla and the posterior mandible in the first molar area when they placed implants. And they found out that within one year, we have, independent on the type of the temporalization, removable or fixed, soft tissue changes, and of course, scar tissue changes, maybe dependent on the implant design, which has been used, but the soft tissue becomes here reduced. We have loss of the height. And if you look now, all of these numbers, this is from the publication. What is going on here? I'm sorry. 82% of the buccal areas, they have recessions. Did you understand that? This is the first molar area. If we have the same thing in the anterior aesthetic zone and we have this kind of recession, 80% plus recession, this can be a disaster for some of the patients. In addition to that, I think, oh, here you see, after one year, maxilla and mandible doesn't have any big changes, any big differences. So that means the soft and hard tissue responds in the same way in the maxilla and the mandible within one year period of time. Now I think Lyndon had to go to the red eye back home to go to North Carolina. The last issue of the JOMI, he published with the folks from Germany, friends of mine, Matthias Kern, Perostodontist at the University of Kiel, Jörg Wirthbank and his team um, in uh, the University of Kiel. I work with these folks who are very good friends together, but I have not been involved in this study. So here in this study, they showed that if you place implants and you load these implants in the hilt ridges or in the extraction sockets, you have after a period of one year similar effects in the soft and the hard tissues. But... The question is, and I bring this question mark from my lecture today in this podium, how is the soft and hard tissue not after one year, after five or 10 or 20 years? This is my question. I try to show you my data, my experience in the last 10 years, not in the last year, using identical designs in order to improve the protocols. And, last but not least, from one of the patients who you saw before, I showed you the seven-month follow-up with a very nice result. This patient, two weeks later, passed away. Unfortunately, of course, but from the research standpoint, fortunately, she had decided before her death to donate these implants. And together with Adriano Piatelli, Karina Johansson, Tonino Traini, we published uh, last year in the Journal of Periodontology a very nice histomorphometrical data, which shows specifically for this implant design with platform switching and progressive threads, under immediate loading conditions, even if the patient was a heavy smoker and had, had hemother under hemotherapy in the hospital, under hospitalized conditions, that the biological width, which is the connective tissue attachment and the epithelial attachment, the biological width in the maxillary implants was significantly higher than in the mandibular implants, which means the soft tissue in the maxilla responds completely different around this collar and around this implant design compared to the mandible. And I have one minute and 50 seconds. Two more cases. Extraction of these teeth. We place always the implants in my clinic here under the, underneath the mid-facial uh, crest of the bone, three millimeters, and you see it here in the immediate implant placement. In order to avoid to have disaster results at the end, and in this case, we load the implants immediately, and you see after six months, we, uh, six weeks, we have this soft tissue around the implants, and then we decided in this particular case to remove the abutments, which I don't do that in a routine basis, and we did the impression from the implant level, and the patient had, excuse me, the patient had a very nice soft tissue and around these customized abutments. And after two years, we had a very nice aesthetic result and also radiographically no bone loss. And last but not least, one step further, if the patient has low smile line, if the patient has no sufficient money to support here, can we extract these teeth and to do 
two implants and here a three unit bridge. Is that possible? Is there anybody who has done that before? So we push the envelope a step further. Yeah, in our studies at the University of Rochester, this is the low or moderate smile line of the patient. Most patients, they don't smile when you extract the tooth, you know that. They try to avoid, that's why I said low or moderate smile line. We place the implants, <coughs> 4.5 millimeter diameter implant, and before that, I insert cancellous bone grafting material into the sockets because we didn't have any kind of dehiscences. The back of bone was relatively thick, and we had some, some kind of uh, concavities uh, at the interface between the implant and the surrounding bone. The implants have been placed. Immediately after that, you see subcrestal implant placement, abutment connection, out of occlusion, certainly, and the patient uses for three to four months soft liquid diet. Preoperatively looks like that. Postoperatively looks like that. The provisionalization, we avoid to have the perfect provisionalization. And this is the final result after one year, which shows to you folks in the three unit bridge, in the anterior aesthetic zone, we have stabilization of the soft and the hard tissue over the platform. If you avoid to remove the abutments, if you use subcrestal implant placement, and if you use the immediate loading concept. And with these words, I come to my conclusions. <clears throat> if you have a patient with low smile line, everything is possible. You decide in one hour, saying some jokes to the patient, and you make your treatment plan. If your patient has a moderate smile line, you decide for delayed or immediate loading. Ask the patient, inform the patient. Your patient has to know what is immediate loading. Most of the patients, they don't have any idea. That's why they believe immediate, uh, delayed loading is the, uh, uh, um, uh, the successful um, concept of treatment. And at the end, if you have patients with high smile line, certainly I avoid from the beginning the immediate implant placement and I have to use from the beginning special implant designs specifically to consider the long-term uh, heart and soft tissue stability. And for that reason, I need to have a special kind of colors and type of abutments. And with these words, I'd like to thank you very much for the kind invitation and also the kind attention with best regards from my city, from the University of Rochester, New York. Thank you.